It's not reserve command, it's rather command aborts, but so yeah, meaning, um, or rather timeout and abort handling again. But, yeah, sure, go ahead. So uh, as discussed several times recently, um, command aborts from user land are tricky. So the issue is, what do you do if you have a VM running? You have a VM which is trying to do I.O. It does I.O. But then the VM sets a timeout on that I.O. within the VM, sends down the I.O., QMU gets the I.O. and sends it off to the underlying host. Sadly, the VM has no way of transmitting the timeout to QMU because it's using a standards interface, say AHCI, SATA, NVMe, you name it, none of which are equipped to transport a timeout. So when leaving the KVM guest, all information about the timeout is gone. Hence, it's anyone's guess whether the timeout you set in the, in the VM is identical to the timeout which the host is using. And more often than not, they will not be because application which will really care, let's say cluster application, will set their own timeout, which probably is different and i.e. shorter than the default timeout. Otherwise, we would be point setting it if it's longer. Which means that a timeout might trigger on the host or in the, in, the, uh, in the VM, and the VM tries to abort the command. And then it sets an, uh, sends an abort command which will be duly transmitted to uh, transmitted to, uh, to QMO. And then QMO says, hmm, no, that is bad because I can't really do, do anything with it because it's either an IO control, in which case I can't abort it at all. It might be lib IO, in which case I can abort it, but the abort on lib IO is simply canceling of the Q element within in the internal lib IO ring. Again, not doing an abort whatsoever or it's IOU ring, in which case I can't abort it either. So you're stuck and you have to wait for the command completion to come in, which means that the um, in, in the VM, there's a timeout handler, but that timeout handler simply says, retry and wait until you get a completion. And that's your system fucked. And yes, we have a rather large customer which has been complaining about this one since, well, years actually. And we always have to try to uh, try to come up with different ways how we could handle it. None of the ways we have been tested and tried worked. So having essentially we have a two ways out of that. The one is see if we can implement the command timeouts from user space. Or alternatively, that is where CDL comes in. It, alternatively, if we have a way of transmitting the timeouts then everything would be aligned and we would drastically reduce the possibility of ever to have sent, ha having to send aborts. So that's the proposal here. Clearly the, using the CDL way is an easier way because CDL is a standard and that is we have a nice patch set and that's about to, due to be merged. So that is, should be going, uh, should be getting relatively easy. So then we only need a patch set for QMO, translating the CDL settings into the request timeout, which the QMO internally will be using and everything will be nice and dandy. Nearly dandy because there's still a risk of you getting a time with despite setting to a CDL because as Damon is one to remind me, CDLs are best, best effort only. So you might still be hitting timeouts. And at which, point, at which point we are back to square one and don't have timeouts and screw it again. So I take it this application is uh, probably a SCSI application. Uh, that is used to sending aborts to uh, the app. The it's the driver. Right, 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 right. That's internal in the driver. So right. the normal, the NVMe, it's typically the NVMe driver in um, either it's the NVMe driver, the SATA driver, you name it. All of these can abort, can abort commands and they do. Because right. normally they're talking to the hardware and the hardware is able to do the aborts internally. But in the case of QEMO, you're talking to the emulation and the emulation right. has, to trans, trans, uh, has to convert the incoming abort into something which the host understands but right. there's nothing we just can't convert it to because there's nothing even it can so, do so this is a problem with qemu yes. emulation 
Okay. Yes. This is primarily QML thing. Or consequently, not, not directly QML thing, anything which needs to do aborts from user land. So it's just that QML features prominently in here because that's the use case, or rather, ever so slightly on every customer which we have. So um, the alternative so, idea, yeah? So Hannes, the, the timeout that's usually sent out from from the application, right, right an, an individual I.O. timeout, that isn't necessarily the total amount of time, and in fact, usually isn't, um, that, say, the SCSI mid layer will spend trying to perform your I.O. before it exhausts the retries and gives up. We know. Right? That's right. So when you when you map the the CDL setting, does it take that into account, or is it is the time the timeout is details? So these are really detailed. So we can figure it out once we have defined what we what we are going to do. So clearly we can set anything and we can shorten do something. Key point here is that with CDL you can transport the timeout settings from one okay. layer to the other. Okay, so really what you're talking about is this is a CDL is a way to pass the the information. Yes, um, precisely. Down to it the, is not about implementing the form of the IO of, of what you actually intended. Yes, precisely. Right. So this is not about implementing CDL such that we can pass three Ls down to the underlying layer, but rather that we interpret CDLs in QEMO such that we QEMO can do the right thing. So okay, so conceptually, how is this different from giving CDLs to a storage array and how the storage array will handle it? Right? I mean, is isn't that analogous? Yeah, roughly. Yeah. So, which of the ten billion storage backends in QEMU are we talking about here? What what you know? There's so many ways you can do I/O. What 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 is your target? So. Um... The targets are typically those where you can set a time where it really makes sense to have a timeout. That is the MSG interface where you can easily can set the request timeout because it even has a bloody field allowing you to do so. And the other one is IAU ring where you also can set the request directly in the SQ, uh, the timeout directly in the SQE if I remember correctly. So you know that in with fertile block you can set up also an IO priority. Uh, which is totally undocumented in the specifications, by the way. Yes, you can. But then again, you have to transport this information. The point is that currently we have no way allowing us to cross the boundary no, of course, from but... the VM down to QEMO. <clears throat> well, if you are using Vertio SCSI, you just get the CDL index from the SCSI command. And you're if done. we have CDLs, again, as I said, if we have CDLs, everything's fine. Well, but Martin is about to queue everything. So, so yes. Well, good. So, so if we have CDL, yeah, yeah exactly. So if CDL, if we have CDL, everything, everything's fine. Now I just um, so so yeah. is Vertio SCSI then an acceptable solution, or yeah, do sure. you need Vertio Block? Or no, 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 no. Vertio SCSI is perfectly fine. Yeah, sure, because that's actually what they're using currently. So yeah, that, that's perfectly fine. Um, another idea was whether it wouldn't be possible to have to implement command aboids on um, IOU ring. That's essentially the taking a queue from the ATA, ATA spec. And so, um, because currently, IU is using the polling interface, which essentially means so um, it polls on completions. Mm -hmm. And the kernel will notify him, right, this amount of completions has ha have happened. And then it needs to go looking, right, which of these commands I'm looking for have com completed. That's the IU ring submitter, which needs to do it. We could. Um, abuse this mechanism to do aborts in the sense that we can implement, or it should be possible to implement an additional um, command, which will abort our all outstanding commands on that queue, which should be relatively easy to, to transmit to the underlying layers because you wouldn't even need to know which commands you abort. You can just say, well, whatever you have, abort. Then we would be getting completions back, meaning the polling interface would continue to work. We would be getting com completions back. We could be looking, right, is that command which I wanted to abort in there? Return it and resubmit the, uh, the remaining bits. But you, I mean, if you're sending down an IO ring abort operation, yeah. you know what your SQE 
CQE thing is. You know that, but we can, but um, this is an abstract number. This only has a meaning with an IOU ring. It has no meaning outside of it. But you already converted from IOU ring to an IO operation once. So yes, you on the way down. Yeah. But do I get the information back about the identifier, which ends up down at the bottom layer? But you still need to handle IO completion, right? So, you know, the information exists. Right? Otherwise, how are you going no, to get the IO? But, but yeah, but it's, it's disconnected. So, and, and how do you actually cancel things depending on your backend storage? Sure, you can do some ugly things with ATA, that's easy, but SAS and NVMe, I mean, it's not that easy to cancel everything. Well, we can, you know, details are ever so slightly hazy here. And, um, and uh, if it's a QCO image backed by a file, you can cancel anything. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. You can, they, they are clearly, I mean, this whole thing only will work if you have the means of sending, of basically whether the underlying storage allows you to send aboards. If you if the underlying storage doesn't allow you to send aboards, clearly this won't work. But that, that sounds to me like it's such a, a corner case in the end. Is it really useful? So it remains to be seen. I guess CDLs will bring us a long way. What? Okay, but with the current NVMe aboard definition, yeah. you know, the host can a QEMU can emulate this. Sure. sure, send me an aboard, right? It doesn't have to do anything with it. You can just return the aboard, say, and if because it's a lot of it's gonna what QEMU does with this, it's good, like Damien said is going to entirely be an implementation specific yes. thing yeah. of if, if it has the ability to do anything with an yes. aboard on the back end. Yes. Yes, fully correct. But at currently we will always have to do nothing because we have if we have for no back end whatsoever any means for aborting. What's the improvement from there? It doesn't sound like it, it's a big deal. So you know it's be a lot of work. You could build a barrier that can be really easy for it. I don't think it's worth yet. That would not work. So yeah, and that really remains to be seen, I guess. As I said, I guess if we have CDLs, it'll bring us a, a long way. Yeah, but yes. then but the ABM Cloud has a somewhat daft setup where the volume images are on NFS, which are then exported back up to the virtual but yeah, but you see the problem. And we use Vertio Block, which has no preset timeout. And we switched to Vertio SCSI so we could basically tell the uh, customer VMs to set the timeout to pretty much machine infinity so we never got aborts. Because the problem was not, would never be solved by actually sending an abort down. The problem was basically solved just by waiting for NFS to get its act together. Are you sure you need to actually transmit the abort or can't you adjust the timeout? So, um... Yes, we are, because the um, the real story, so meaning the long story is that that customer wants to do A, multipathing for the VMs and B, persistent reservations okay. for the VMs. And so he has the chance of either running multipath within the VM, which requires you to do aborts that you can switch over paths. And then you're able to use persistent reservations or move multipathing into the host such that multipathing actually works. How does multipathing work? Right? Maybe the application wants to use aborts with multipathing, but no, you know. it's not. No, no, no. So I mean, you, you need to switch over. Yeah. And you switch over when? It's exactly when one path fails, which means there will be outstanding commands on that path. Right. And these you have to abort. They will not be coming back. You have to actively telling, please abort these commands. You're saying on the other path. Yeah, on the failed path. There are outstanding commands on the failed path because the path, the path has, has bloody failed. So, Hannes. You can't send an abort in a failed path, right? So yes, unless, but you're, you unless you're even, talking but you about even unless reset, you're talking you about some reset type proper. of uh, you know SCSI has a third party abort type of thing, right? But ab the abort thing, the uh, abort the the command on the other IT ne ITL nexus, right? But if your path has failed, then you know you're not going to get a SCSI abort through there. Try and send it, but it won't get a response to that one either. And can I abort it? 
Yes, but um, no, what but the, the thing is, you, you can't, so, no, 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 no. You have outstanding commands when the path has failed. These commands are not only in your VM, but more particularly in the hardware of the host. Right. So, and they are being mapped directly into the VM. Okay, you can, if you want to, do a reset of your VM emulation, which you would be doing normally for, for multipathing, do a reset there, which you can do. That doesn't really help at all for the hardware underneath. So I haven't looked at QEMU's implementation, say, for instance, of the SCSI interface. Yeah. Right. But I have to imagine it, you know, has the ability to, uh, you know, receive an abort. Whether or not it does anything with yeah. it is going to be entirely an implementation dependent thing. Exactly. It could, be, it does. It, it could do nothing, something yeah. it could do nothing. And, you know, the, the uh, you know, abort recovery, you know, algorithms, if the application, if has an IO, timeout pops, send the abort. Well, nothing's going to happen. It doesn't yes. come back. That will eventually escalate, you know, and get a one reset or a controller reset. And you're just going to, you can't, that's, do a that's reset. where you go. You can't do a reset. How would you do a no, reset? What I'm saying is that, is that th this is entirely the emulation and emulation problem, right? It's there, there's, if yes, of course, it is partially an emulation problem because the emulation can't do a reset on the underlying hardware. Right, but what I'm saying is that uh, I don't understand. I think you're talking to the wrong people. You should be talking to the QEMU people, right? No, so so uh, tell me, what, what what are we supposed to do? We have so, so normally one. normally so what the underlying hardware does, say fiber channel, fiber channel is sending the board if there's an error. It so basically tries to figure out what what's going on all these kind of things. But we have no idea what the fiber channel underneath does from, from within QEMU. Sure. So, but we have no way of telling what it does. So when, when we, when, when we did, uh, you know, the abort yeah. cancel, thing, you know, yeah. uh, enhancements, this is one of the things we had in mind, right? We, yes, but, we, but again, we, we wanted the abort and the cancel to be able to return some type of meme status that says, hey, I did nothing. Yes. Right. So you did net nothing. And so that way, you, at least not like in the SCSI case, you're stuck in the situation where you send the abort and then the abort times out as well. Right. Because that's not helping anything. It's a stupid protocol. So you just got, you know, cascading timeouts. So we tried to. Uh, Fix the protocol, and whether or not the controller does anything with the abort or with the cancel is entirely that we've got. You know, I don't understand yes. what it is that we're going to do to solve that problem. So, yes, I, I know, but the problem is so that we're having two different set of I command identifications we have one command identification in the VM, and we have another completely different command identification in the host. Okay, so we, so can, we so will be sending a, a cancel command. From the VM, that will be tunneled through. You will be seeing it in the queue. Everything's nice and dandy. Okay, so maybe maybe what we want is we want some type of an interface to be able to understand what the command identifier was that was assigned for the particular I/O that I sent down. That and is, if, the... and and so if I could basically you know provide that information back up to the caller or something or somehow or other come up with some way where it could be deterministic, it could be understood or determined, then you could create another yeah, interface yeah. that could actually say, send down the abort command. I need the command identifier. Here it is. I know what it is. I couldn't agree more. Okay. Sadly, so our if, stack if, isn't, if our stack. If that's what the proposal is, I think I can understand that. So, but this is not the proposal because our stack is not set up for doing so. Well, right. So the idea, so the would, stack, the idea would be to, to add that functionality. So currently the stack is unidirectional only. So you're sending down IO and on each step on the way, the IO might or will be transformed into something else. So any ID you're setting in one stage will be lost in the next stage. So, and duplicated and striped and whatnot, converted, you name it. So there is no direct relationship between the I.O. you're issuing to the I.O. which has been sent down to the hardware. So there really any identifier which you were able to set are completely meaningless to the other layer. They simply have no relationship whatsoever. So I guess uh, while that's true largely, but uh, I think 
uh, underneath the block layer, the moment we are entering into the block layer, I think we have something. This is why this is why that the polling is able to work because we have something called cookie that is written after the submission and we end up storing it. This cookie is also used during completion. That is why we are able to do completion polling. So cookie is a thing which is recognized from, you know, underneath and, the block layer, right? Who generates the cookie? The cookie is the request, right? It's, yeah, so uh, cookie is having two things, like right? The... As far as NVMe is concerned, cookie is having two things. It's having QID. It is also having command ID. It's just that, I mean, this is what we probably require for abort or cancel command, right? We only use it for polling um, at this point of time. And the way we use it uh, for, let's say, our urine based polling, we don't really care about a specific completion. We never try to say that we want to poll for a specific IO. We say whatever IO gets completed, that's over. So that's why, as far as user, user interface is concerned, there is no such thing. But it seems to me that it, it should be possible to, to you know, to hook that up, uh, maybe match with, uh, yeah, with. But, the... but then, as, as you already don't care which command completion you get, why can't you just have a normal console all command? Because then the commands will be aborted. They will, will have a certain status. Most of them, the status will be aborted, and then it's up to the issuing application to say, all right, so these have been aborted. I have to do something here, and then he can do something there. But the commands would be aborted. So, Hannes, yep. if I could ask a question, sorry. I know you guys are probably talking to each other and I'm interrupting, but Hannes, um, when you said that you would be using Vert IO SCSI because you want to be able to support reservations in the guest, right? Yeah. So, if you're using Vert IO SCSI, um, if you get a timeout, you're going to issue an abort through a task no, management. It's disabled. We're not issuing aborts because they don't work, so they are disabled. The, okay. uh, the time attend of a virtual SCSI is preset timeout. Okay. But I mean, is there any reason why making that work would not solve your problem? If you can make it work, be my guest. We couldn't. Okay. I see. So I think if I come back to it, so do you see issue if we if we uh, if we connect uh, the cookie that is there in the block layer with with a user space identifier? In case of IURing, that happens to be something called uh, user data. That is how you identify a particular command. If we connect that with the block layer cookie, do you think this problem is solved, or or do you see gaps? We have to look here how this whole thing will will work, but then. Um... Well, I, I don't know. We have, we have to see so yeah. how, whether it works. So it really depends on whether you're able to use IO ring on stack devices or not. So if so the, the bio you're looking at for the bio you're looking at or uh, for your polling might be the last one of the chain. So your cookie is essentially useless because you would still have to cancel a lot of requests before canceling everything. Yep. So really, I, I guess the user, the best option here really would be cancel all because you really, as said, we really don't know what which I we actually sent down underneath and how it looked like. We might be getting a cookie back, which has relationship to parts of the IO we sent, but these are not. All right. So with the cancel command, as you know, we can basically send down the cancel request and say actually, you know, cancel or abort everything on this yeah. IO queue. Exactly. That's what we would we would want to do. Yes. Right. Yeah. So I agree that I think this is this is likely to go right when we have one to one relationship. Uh, but yes, when we have one to one relationships, something we have we submitted one well, command which turned out to be n commands down the line. We don't really have a cookie as such. You know, that's represented well, the whole. I, I, I think that, that's what your point is. But I think that you know, Damien's point is there's no such thing as a one to one relationship with a request or yep. even a bio and a command. It is possible because you know at times we have whenever we have if you think of polling that you know that's the, you know, that's what we do right whenever yep. the I O is not split we are able to poll for it when it is split when it becomes one to end relationship we are not able to poll for right. it right yeah and, and what, I mean, what it is the same cookie concept right and what if the request is merged <laughs> uh, I think yeah we we. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Precisely. <laughs> so. All right. Good. Okay. Cool. That was it. Oh, yes. And I will be sending uh, the research commands patch set again.
yeah right so just to let people know uh you and, and i did have one other quick topic to discuss we're going to do that at four o'clock at the lightning talk session hopefully right at the beginning he wants to yeah so it's, you uh, it's, it's sort of a pity because i don't really know that we need to talk to the whole room but sure and it's quick anyway uh, um, unless there's some time to squeeze it in now or you want to do it now you want can well, we do it now if let, people let me, let me, uh, i'm gonna go get up and plug my laptop in hold on yeah. it's really only an io thing and this is going to probably take like two minutes but i'll do it whenever that'd be good because we need our coffee <laughs> Of course. It's late in the day. Um, I can't see anything and I can barely hear it, you guys. All right. You cannot you? you can't see it now? Right. Yeah, there you go. Um right. yeah, so this is this is real quick and I'll give a background on this. Um the basic thing is um it has to do with a change that we made, I don't know, a couple of years ago now, um, where we changed to use the driver core for asynchronous uh, SCSI device probing. Um, and this has had a side effect that the um, minor device numbers for SD devices are now essentially randomized at boot on uh, various people's systems. And we're getting a ton of complaints about it. Now, historically, we have always documented that we never guarantee that the minor numbers are going to be the same, um, especially for fabric attached disks. And we have documentation to this effect. Uh, regardless, they were um, popularly used, and especially in the context of provisioning devices to VMs. And there's also a case, uh, a use case with MPT3 SAS. And so, um, this change that we made basically made it so that we have people saying we can't upgrade to newer kernels because this kernel just doesn't work and there doesn't seem to be any way to get predictable behavior. And so, of course, we tell them, well, you know, you really weren't supposed to use the SDA numbers and the Meyer device numbers in this way and go look at the documentation. But, you know, this falls on uh, this falls on uh, deaf ears from people that were used to it working for some for so long right so we, we the other said problem that we... that's, that's actually a legitimate issue is that if you make um a synchronous call to scuzzy add device and say you make multiple synchronous calls because you're adding a bunch of devices you might rightly expect that you would get uh devices added in order um, but this turns out not to be the case and so we effectively changed the uh, kernel API when we did that. So um, you can go to the next one, John. So um, the question is whether, is there any um, support whatsoever for adding uh, a way to have some compatibility module option or something that would let people get um, the old behavior? Um, of course, there's a bunch of disadvantages to that. Um, and one thing is it would make all of the probing asynchronous, not just the um, minor device assignment. So if you got to go and read all of EPD pages and stuff, it would take forever if you had a lot of devices. Um, it's a step backward in where the kernel's going with asynchronous probing. And, you know, the real issue is that, you know, it's not so much the fact that the numbers are different. It's the fact that we exposed them to user space and they were popularly used. Um, another I, I complaint mean, to notice that I get is that this behavior doesn't happen with the assignment of SCSI generic minor device numbers because, of course, those get probed synchronously when you go and add the device. There, it, it isn't deferred to uh, an asynchronous thread in the driver core. All right. If, if you then, were to queue such a workaround, Ewan, 
Mm -hmm. I mean, we're just postponing the pain. Eventually, somebody's going to have to rip that Band-Aid off and update their FS tab or whatever. Well, it's even worse than that. The pain will exist. It will just be found less often. There's still no guarantee that synchronously probed devices come up in the same order because of the way the lower subsystems like PCI do asynchronous discovery. I mean, fine, if we try and do it synchronously, you'll get you'll only get a failure one every few thousand times instead of pretty much every boot, but they'll still get failures. Right. I mean, but the problem so difficult is about using labels or UUIDs or all of the other stuff that we've had in for years to fix this. Right. Yeah. And, you know, and this is correct. Right. And of course, I make all these arguments with the people who are asking for, you know, the old behavior. And I say, look, it has never actually been the way that you think it was. It just happened to work for you because you had a fairly well-defined system. The problem is that there's a lot of people with fairly well-defined systems and we essentially threw a roll of the dice into the mix. The real complaint is it's not just that it's different. It's the fact that it's different on every boot and you never get the same numbers twice on every boot on some of these people's machines. And this is a problem for them. The other thing is that we have people who for, you know, I won't get into the, the exact details of the cases because it's somewhat complicated, but there's people that essentially tell us well, you know, we can't go and make use of like dev by ID because we're using a deployment model where we're trying to use a single image and deploy it to multiple systems. And the IDs are different, but the minor devices would have been the same. And, you know, that means we got to go and essentially customize everything for, you know, the thousand systems that we're trying to spin up, right? So, and, you know, there's probably ways around that too, but that involves work on their part. And, you know, again, the question comes back to why on earth did you change it? So something you may want to tell to the users of the old cardinal is that the uh, old behavior as Tracy, the notification, the UDEF event that uh, device has been, uh, uh, that probing has finished, is sent to user space before the SCSI driver has finished probing. Well, right. It, I mean, that, that isn't so much the issue. The issue is that the way we used to do it was that the minor device assignment was synchronous when we did the probe, and the rest of it was asynchronous. But the so, minor so device can, assignment was always the synchronous can, part. Can I just go back to your original point? All they really care about is that SDA, B, C, and D come up in the same order. What if we did something like network does, which where you can get F1, F2, F3 to come up in the same order, and under the covers, they're basically doing UUIDs on the network devices, if you look at how UDEV does it. I mean, would that be a simple workaround for this? As in, effectively, you're figuring out what the UUIDs are under the covers, then installing a file, and they think that dev A, B, C, and D come, all come up in the same order. We can, even, we can even do a slightly crazier version of that where we call use the report and set device identifying and identification to SDA, SDB, SDC. So the devices are really going to be called SDA, SDB, yeah, SDC. Right. I mean, we, we can fix the boot order just by doing something like this if that's what they really want. But right. is that what they really want? Yes. The, I think the problem is, is that for ages, we have said, you know, we will not support you know these consistent names you need to use device by ad but then every kernel we publish for the next few years you know would always reboot it consistently given so they just said they're well we're not going to change our applications we're not going to you know and then all of a sudden we actually started doing these you know asynchronous probing it was we all understood how it worked but because empirically that's not what the customer experienced when they rebooted or even when they upgraded or installed to an, they they just well we don't have to deal with this problem so we're just going to ignore that that and are they actually interested in the block devices and not file systems or database disk labels or is it actually like raw block block device access that they're interested in yeah so instead of proposing a solution i think we should state the problem the problem is, is they want consistent names at this at the slash dev entry that's what they want that's what the customer wants that's what they expect even though we told them that's actually technically not possible, that you can't depend upon that, that's what they want. And that's what they're, that's what they're, basically it's a requirement they're telling us. 
okay, the no, other they use... will have to implement that requirement themselves using the facilities that are already there. Well, no, no, I think Red Hat can do it using UDEV. We yeah. just basically record the UIDs on first boot. That becomes the default order, yep. and UDEV reorders everything on second next boot to match that order. That's what I mean. It's a scripting problem. Yeah. You, you can get what you want. You just have to tell the system to do it that way. Yeah, I mean, I... I do. I mean, there are multiple people that are asking about this and they have slightly different use cases. I do have one um, fairly large um, user who is basically saying, you know, if I have, you know, one zero target unit zero, I want that to be SDA just like it always was. If I have, you know, one one one, I want that to be SDB. How come you changed it? Right. Um, so there, you know, um, figuring out at first boot and then making it the same um, isn't isn't what they want either. Although presumably a UDEV rule could go and look at the physical, you know, one numbering and you know say, all right, this is clearly what it ought to be. The UDEV rule can do whatever you want. So you, if you yeah. want it to be done by LUN and target, it can do it. Uh, right. Provided the target, I mean, remember the host number is not necessarily guaranteed to be the same. You're getting into all sorts of nasty problems here. But if we script around it and we don't have to worry about it in the kernel, uh, are we done as far as kernel stuff goes? You and you, uh, you, did you have more? Uh, so I had one more slide, um, which it's sort of a so somewhat related problem, but wasn't uh, didn't derive from the customers complaining about the. Um, the probing behavior change. And that is, we are seeing similar questions regarding um, NVMe identifiers, because of course, NVMe, there has never been any consistent behavior. All of the numbers that get exposed to user space are the kernel's internal instance IDs, and they're all over the place, um, particularly the controller numbers because of the discovery controller lifetimes, right? And um, I guess the question is, you know, are we really being kind enough to our users by exposing all this kernel internal, you know, um, instance numbering as things that they see and interact with? You do NVMe list and you get, you know, uh, a whole bunch of uh, things that purport to refer to your devices, but they're different every time you go and uh, boot your system or go and do, you know, NVMe connect all or whatever. Right, so um, uh, I, I, might, I may have a solution for that problem, and that's something we've been working on for a little bit. That's, it's sort of like a side feature to something else we're working on. Um, but from the problem of managing, you know, thousands of SCSI LUNs and multipathing and figuring out which devices relate to which other devices and hosts and, uh, you know, host Host two is that the Emulex or the QLogic HBA and all that stuff. So we've been working on a tool that tries to uh, be friendly. Of course, Guzzy, we mm -hmm. can entertain NVMe and allows users to name their devices. So they can say, this HBA is Bob and this HBA is Fred and this disk is Susie or whatever. And when you use that tool to inquire about those devices, the user chosen names will be the ones that you see. Of course, that's not gonna fix the problem if you're using an Emulex utility to you know, update firmware or whatever, but at least for some of the tooling, we'll have slash dem names that ma also matches whatever the user used to name that thing um, on the command line or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I have some similar tooling like that for looking at crash dumps and log files and things like that in a customer environment where, you know, they they give you a bunch of log files from uh, crashes on different days, and you can't be 100% sure that the devices you're looking at in one are the same as in the other. So yeah. it kind of digs in and looks at it and tries to match them up, right? Yeah. So what you're saying is something like that could be used to sort of provide users a way to um, sort of refer to their devices, um, particularly if they were sort of managing their own, you know, environment deployment, um, so yep. it was easier on them as well. I mean, one of the biggest problems we have, honestly, is customers that have got 50, 50 systems that are more or less identical, 
um, that are running some application, but the devices aren't always the same from system to system and trying to figure out if, uh, if a problem is seen, you know, one week on one system and then three weeks later it's seen on a different system, trying to figure out if you're looking at the same thing. So that could be very helpful. Yeah. You know, it's so, so I, again, it's sort of like the, it, it comes down to, you know, this whole we keep we we sort of we assign things in the kernel based on, you know, IDA alloc or something that's just assigning numbering into the kernel. That's only the lifetime of that particular boot. Um, but this information, we keep exposing it. We expose it all over the place. And it, right. it's so it's painful for people to use. So I, I think I think the real answer here is enough, you know, let's not go change the kernel, which actually is not actually fixing the problem. It's just creating the side effect that we want that's going to meet the expectations, attack the problem straight on and say, what are the expectations of the customer and the requirement, develop the tools with the existing technology we have, or maybe make a new tool oh, we have the to technology. solve the problem. Net, Net already does this. We just steal their scripts. They record the order on first boot, and they redo the order every time it reboots. Yeah, but I think and, I think to Martin's point, it's a little bit more than just what was the first order on the first boot. They actually really, what the customer not, really not wants, they want to say, I want, I want that device to be named this, and that device to name that in perpetuity. I, I agree. We, we can do... Uh, much better job at appeasing our users for the, i mean even like the whole file system uuid or whatever that's also not user friendly right they would rather call it bob than you know yeah. however many hex characters of string for an eui 64. Or incidentally whatever. not to speak ill of our colleagues but if we don't get to t soon they'll have stolen all okay. snakes <laughs> Thank you. All right. And thank you, you and well, this has been very good, and I appreciate your time taken out of your break, everybody. So, but this that's all I had, and this is very helpful. Thanks. All right. Cool. Thanks, guys. Thank you.